responsibilities and all the obligations that the current challenges of our world, of our Europe, uh, place on the shoulders, the very strong shoulders of, of cities across Europe. Uh, so yesterday was really, uh, I think you will agree, a very inspiring day. Certainly I was inspired. Also very inspiring, I thought, was the poem we heard from Adriana Beltran at the official dinner and, and the drinks that we had afterwards on that fabulous rooftop of the City Hall. Um, so today is going to be, I hope, as stimulating and as inspiring and, and as interactive as we were yesterday. So we have a packed day. We're going to start uh, with the leadership program of Barcelona. We're going to have city pledges, and then we have a panel discussion as well. So I'm going to be very, I'm going to be working very hard, and I hope you'll be listening and will be uh, finding it interesting and informative. Just a few housekeeping rules. Um, same as yesterday, actually. The session is live streamed, so hello to everyone who's joining us uh, online. Um, interpretation today, Catalan number one, Spanish number two, and English is number three. And of course, as yesterday, we encourage all of you, all of you, to tweet uh, and go on social platforms. And um, I think you see the hashtags here, hashtag SAF Barcelona 2022, and hashtag inclusive cities for all. So uh, first on the agenda, first on the agenda for today is listening to young people. We are in 2022, it's the European Year of Youth. Actually, it's also the Year of Youth in ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And so let's give our attention as we kick off this day, uh, this fascinating day, with listening, by listening to young people, find out about their stories and get to know how young people contribute to making Barcelona a city of social rights, an inclusive city which celebrates, celebrates diversity. Um, so first we have a video. And the video will explain to us uh, Barcelona's youth leadership program. So with me, please watch the video. Eh, antes que la Barça, Barcelona. De nada, para mí ha sido una manera de aprender un otro punto de vista. En el programa de Nordia de Ratchas he aprendido a nivel personal como a nivel de Ainas. Lo que he aprendido no se puede explicar solo con palabras, va más allá de eso. Son experiencias que te llevas con personas que, aunque diferentes, comparten muchísimo contigo. Y al programa Nordia de Ratchas, pues ya aprendes, bueno. Eh, muchas cosas, hacer charlas sobre todo con la gente que con Agud, con el meu grup de, de compañeros y compañeras y que no los había, no, si no los habría con Agud si no es fet el proyecto, ¿no? ¿Qué has aprendido en este, de este curso? Pues a tener más seguridad en mí misma y en poder Me ha ampliado un montón la visión a nivel de conocer eh, proyectos eh, de, diferentes, de diferentes orígenes y de diferentes gestiones. Me ha dado un cierto empoderamiento, ¿no? De, de, bueno, a partir de ahora, pues, he de hacer más cosas, eh, no te has de limitar, eh, has podido uh, ir más, 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 más allá ¿no? de, lo que, de lo que estás haciendo. Al conocer a estas personas, si tengo algún problema o algo, eh, puedo contar con ellos para, para poder seguir creciendo en el barrio. Y a mí me encanta poder tener herramientas que no sabía y poder utilizarlas en, en mi propio barrio. Como oportunidad de aplicación total que aprendes, uh, podría ser incentivar a los jóvenes a aprender de esta manera, porque creo que es la manera para poder participar, ¿eh? es la chispa para poder participar y dins del que pasa al barrio. Casi sé que me em servirá para tener un futuro mejor, para poder trabajar mejor en el meu ámbito y para poder reforzar esta xarxa social que, que estem fent tots y todas, como com yo, al casco del su barrio. Considero vital que, que, esta, que, que este proyecto, que, que esta eina que se ha creado, 
continúe tirando andaban y que que aplique en otras ediciones. Y pretendo aplicar estos conocimientos como una forma de empoderamiento en futuros proyectos, ideas y, y demás. Recibe trabajos locales con anuncios de servicios locales de Google. Cuando se trata de tu negocio, siempre puedes hacer un poco más, como más encargos de personas de tu zona. We've had the we've had the video, and I think everyone would be quite impressed. So the younger people saying how much they've learned, how empowered they feel, the new experiences, new skills, and 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 the new knowledge that they've acquired through this leadership program. And so we're really delighted that among us here today we have Yusuf Sultan, who is a member of this program as well. He's going to introduce himself as well, but let me just say a few words about him, a few formal words, if you like. So Yusuf is, uh, has a Syrian father and an Andalusian mother. He has two daughters. Congratulations on that, Yusuf. Um, and they're aged one and five. And he's always lived very close to his neighborhood, neighborhood and the su suburban movements that they inspire and motivate. He's been volunteering for different projects from a very young age. Fantastic as well. And currently he's director of the Trinitat Bella Civic Center. He'll tell us a little bit about that center as well. He's responsible for communication at the Reflex Cooperative, and he teaches the Masters in Community Action at IGOP, and as a student of social education at the o Open University of Catalonia. So, Yusuf, please join me here on the stage. Please give us a minute or two to get organized. Great, I get to sit down as well, Yusuf, thanks to you. <coughs> so uh, I have to put on my, I have to put on my um, interpretation, but uh, let me first ask you a very simple question. So we're really, first of all, so delighted you could join us. We saw the video and all those people telling us about all the different things they've learned and how they're motivated for a better future. So I want you to add to this conversation that we just heard, um, what have you learned from this program? Well, it's uh, very difficult to say what have I learned. I, I mean, just one thing, because uh, we will discussing this, and uh, as you will have probably seen, rather than one thing, it's actually a whole transformation encompassing many other things. I don't know how to put it, but it. Uh, I mean, it's. This is probably too big even, but it's kind of a way of understanding life and reinforcing your thoughts and your ways of being and, you know, interpreting what we want to do as young people. What do we want to do? Where do we want to be heard? It's a transformation. Uh, so you learn different things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I just who you are, but of course you're a much more complex and fascinating personality than how I introduced you. That was just a very brief summary of what you've done. But I want to hear from you a little bit more about yourself. Um, you're obviously of mixed heritage, you're here in Barcelona, you have two wonderful daughters. Um, so tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself, what inspires you. Um, let's hear from you. <laughs> Well, what you said in the beginning, my father is from Syria, my mother is from uh, Granada, I was born in Valdebron Hospital. What does that mean for you, this double heritage that you have? It enriches you? Yes, it enriches me, indeed. When I was uh, little and I went to school in Trinidad Bella district, I was uh, one of the first kids uh, you know, coming from uh, with his name, um, Yusef, I mean, they still ask me about that. Uh, and I have to explain. I mean, it's quite more normalized uh, today. There's uh, quite a few Yusef, even in the administration. It's not like they know this one Yusef. I mean, it's something that's gotten more normal than before. But to tell you the truth, uh, as I've... Uh, grown in this social environment, being able to speak and to have 
proximity relationships, uh, rich relationships with people from the Arab world has made things easier. Is a translation in Arabic of Joseph and Jose, you know, in Spain. It's the same name. <clears throat> I used to have a husband called Jose, so in, when we went back to the, my country of origin, Pakistan, he was called Yusuf. <laughs> so, and Cat Stevens' name is uh, also Yusuf now. So it's a very, very, um, let's mm, say, global right name in all religions. Thank you very much for that. Now, talk mm. to us a little bit about the new leaderships program of Barcelona. Well, this uh, new leaderships program, uh, this was a, a program I started like five years ago, four or five years ago. And this is a project we've uh, driven uh, from this neighborhood plan and together with the university at the EOP department at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And it was... Uh, I, the, the start, the beginning was a little weird, maybe, because within this leadership program, there's like two key sections in terms of uh, recruiting the people, which is what in the program we define as the antennas and the uh, young people or the new leaderships. So it's something really specific about this project because these antennas are actually people in the different districts where these new leaderships emerge from and they know the neighborhood, they know their environment and these antennas actually brought in the proposal. They told us they're doing this and they're looking for young people and you, Yusef, I mean, your profile really would fit. So the antenna that gave me this uh, opportunity is actually a reference person for me because uh, He's told me many things, uh, not just in terms of education, but also, you know, in terms of life, right? So these antennas are people. These are the, your, your network, <laughs> in a sense, right? Sí. And so with that network, you're working on different uh, sectors, different areas. So what are the kinds of actions that the program uh, implements or, or works on? Well, it's quite complicated. I mean, to start with, the antennas, the uh, commission uh, they have from the uh, university and the uh, neighborhood plan is they're looking for these people between 20 and 35 and they get the proposal. Might sound a little, um, you know, surreal, surreal because I got this uh, letter signed by the mayor and she said, whether I wanted to be part of this project. So for me, it was, quite, it was kind of weird. I thought there was a, there was a, this was a prank or something because uh, it said, you're going to get this training and you're going to spend three weekends, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and you're going to get to know lots of people like uh, teachers and journalists and people from uh, politics who are referenced for, for these young people. So it was uh, it was actually true, I mean. And from then on, things got started. And there was also this interview process to be part of this new leadership program. In my case, it also made me think this might be a job opportunity. But then I saw it was not. Uh, recruitment process uh, for a job or anything, you know. Very, very different from the traditional way of operating. Much more collective, collaborative, and I would say almost flat rather than mm -hmm. hierarchical, right? Yes, that's right. Actually, one of the different things here is uh, having these antennas. Right in my case, uh, and for all the people who were selected, it's it, it's someone quite near to you. It's not it's nothing suspicious or like uh, they're trying to get you for something seedy or something. No, it's like they they come here and they pay to you. But uh, the way it works uh, is uh, quite horizontal, you know, bottoms up, bottom up, and. Uh, 
the way it prepares you to, to, to see what you're going to go through. So in terms of uh, the active role of young people in the city, you know, promoting neighborhood networks for solidarity, for care, for cohesion, etc., can you give us some examples? Can you give us some of the sort of actions you've taken part in, Youssef? bring to this idea of solidarity and care and cohesion? Well, the idea uh, at the end of the day, what we have perceived, what we have been told, it's uh, actually quite evident things, quite obvious things, but, you know, the way we young people today have the opportunities to show our role or to make ourselves heard is difficult to really strongly position ourselves and uh, it's hard for me to speak as a young person because I'm 35 almost 36 years years old I mean not so young but I have many colleagues who are younger and uh, answering your question actually it's difficult for us to strongly position ourselves in front of uh, inconsistencies and, and injustice when we find it so within this new leadership program they gave us tools and they provided at, us with examples and explanations and we actually experienced things in which the fact of strongly position ourselves in front of these uh, hurdles or complexities or injustices in which uh, young people find themselves in the uh, social arena, the professional arena, the workplace. You know, this strong positioning and making our voice heard in uh, the different spaces where the uh, voice of young people has to be heard, how to do that and how to do that in a creative way, how to do that in an authentic way so that it cannot be pushed back, right? Because sometimes it's like, great, we're going to hear from the young people, give them a, a round of hands, uh, but it's just the words. Well, how to turn these words into, you know, something that actually stays on the paper and stays on record? I mean, it's not like a panacea, it's not like the greatest thing ever, but at least you've got the tools and this experience, this transformation we were talking about, is kind of the central axis of this new leadership program. So um, really empowering, as the word was used, giving you the skills, the leadership skills to engage, to engage on political issues, social issues, uh, economic issues, and being able to speak to journalists, which can be quite a trial, I'm sure. So let me just ask you finally, uh, Youssef, <laughs> what would you like to share with uh, our audience here, with all people participating here about what you want to do next and what you're really sort of, let's say, uh, quite proud of having achieved so far. Well, I'm really proud for uh, being able to work in the neighborhood where I was raised. Uh, I'm from Trinidad Bella, which is uh, on kind of the outskirts of Barcelona. It's a vulnerable area uh, would be uh, you know uh, a typical for tabloids and and, and uh, but at the same time it's a working class and classy neighborhood and I I was born in this intercultural diverse neighborhood with many clashing factors so I'm really proud of being able to work in the civic center there and every monday when i wake up i say right it's monday i'm going to work since i was little as you said in the beginning i've been working in uh, volunteering i was in the education consortium at the exit program i was also in the neighborhoods association we organized a popular race within the uh, festival of the neighborhood then we set up this cooperative so again, I'm, my, my biggest pride is to professionally work, not just as a volunteer, but professionally work on the uh, social issues of my neighborhood.
Thank you very much, Yusuf. Please let's give Yusuf a hand. It's been wonderful to meet you. Very nice. Guys. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf, for talk talking to us about the leadership program and how it empowers and facilitates your leadership skills, puts the leadership skills, and we've seen them in action. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Now, uh, we're going to move uh, on to the city pledges. Um, and once again, this is about, uh, this is uh, online, streamed, etc. And uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Bianca Faragao, with whom I've been working on the EuroCities Social Affairs Forum uh, for the last, what, six weeks or so, Bianca. We've been working very hard uh, to make sure that you get all the information uh, and the inspiration you need. So I'm going to give the floor now to Bianca Faragao for a quick overview of the achievements of the EuroCities City Pledges. So, Bianca, the floor is yours. I think you need to come here. I'll give you the space. Thank you, Sada, and thank you, everyone. Well done, it's very good. So dear members, dear city representatives and distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure and my honor to be here with you and to present a quick overview of our achievements so far with the city pledges. I have to say this is an initiative that evolved uh, over time from a campaign into a movement. And now uh, it, it is really a dream come true to make cities more inclusive for all. Uh, let's uh, remember that it all started in 2017 when the European Pillar of Social Rights was officially proclaimed uh, by the EU institutions at the EU Social Summit in Gothenburg in November 2017. Well, in this format, we were there in Gothenburg a month before and we were anticipating and already proclaiming that we are ready from cities to commit to make social rights for all people and to commit to the European Pillar of Social Rights. And then a year later, in uh, late 2018, we started the campaign, Inclusive Cities for All, Social Rights in My City. And we came a long way from then. Uh, we engage city leaders, mayors, deputy mayors, uh, city representatives present here today as well to commit and to put uh, the principles of European Pillar of Social Rights into action. Uh, and we did that over the last three, four years. We put into action um, through tangible city measures backed by specific budget allocations for this purpose. So far, our campaign reached 71 city pledges and today four more pledges will be announced, uh, announced very soon. So in total, you'll see on the screen, we have 75 pledges from 46 different cities across Europe and um, we reach 54 million Europeans, probably many more people, but this is the official number. And the total budget we calculate is just a minimum, probably is more, but it's 16.5 billion euros um, of municipal investments into social measures. That is impressive. Just to put things into context, in perspective, the Just Transition Fund um, of the EU for seven years is the same budget, and we managed to put this in three years. Uh, so it's really impressive. But these are not just mere promises. We call them pledges, commitments, but they're actually actions, real actions on the ground. So let me explain to you. Uh, 20 cities signed pledges to improve housing support and assistance for the homeless. And over the last uh, two years, three years, we created more than 82,000 new social and affordable housing units, just thanks to these pledges on housing. Then about 20 cities also signed pledges to improve childcare and support to children. Warsaw, for example, has doubled the number of places available in childcare in just two years. And this is really impressive. Right after they pledged uh, to childcare in 2019, um, yes, the number of places in childcare was doubled. In Leipzig, 
also present with uh, us today. On healthcare, Leipzig made available 3.5 million euro uh, more available from the city budget just in 2020 in reaction to the pandemic, which was an increase of 30% since 2015. And this budget was used for reinforcing mental health services of the city. And mental health is also a key focus of a pledge that you will hear about today. Several cities pledged to pilot new schemes for minimum income, such as the new scheme of Lyon Metropole, colleagues that are with us today, uh, a new scheme for youth solidarity income for young people aged 18 to 25. And Lyon will present this in a workshop tomorrow, so you will hear about their uh, pilot scheme. And many cities committed to guarantee equal opportunities for all people, not only for nationals, but also for non-nationals, for refugees. Stuttgart has adopted a pact for integration and invested 77 million euros every year from the municipal budget for social integration measures to support refugees in all areas. So this is just in a nutshell. We have so many actions and we will take stock of all this uh, during uh, this year. Uh, there, there are pledges on about 12 of the 20 principles of the pillar of social rights, but time does not, not allow me to develop on all of that. Uh, what I want to say is that our campaign and your city actions are a real example of commitment of how can we uh, put into practice the principles of the pillar of social rights. And uh, they inspired national policy reforms. And here in Barcelona, you will hear how examples from Barcelona, from the pillar of social rights, inspired national governments to pilot some new measures. And also, we were able to push social rights forward. Just last year, there was the EU Social Summit, and we also had our city social summit and pushed the social rights forward. Our work has reached the hearts and minds of the, at EU level of the EU leaders and we received strong recognition for this initiative and for the work on the city pledges in the EU's action plan for the pillar where our campaign and pledges were referenced 37 times. So by showing concrete actions through our city pledges, we have succeeded to position cities as key actors of social policies in the EU. No one can deny anymore the role of cities in making social policies and in being an actor at EU level. So we've uh, reached a long way and uh, I think we, you should all be proud of what we achieved together. And I myself, I'm very proud of uh, the efforts I see from cities and uh, the actions uh, that come from the pledges. Uh, we are really trying and doing our best to bridge the, um, the gap between the EU and local level and put these social rights into action. So I'm really, really happy to, to be working on this campaign. But we should not stop there. We need to move forward. Today, we are renewing our campaign with a new focus, the focus on inclusive recovery. So we are renaming our campaign on Cities for Inclusive Recovery. And this new focus is to ensure a fair, inclusive recovery for all people in our cities, leaving no one behind. And the four new pledges you will hear today have this new focus, you will hear in a moment. Um, they are clear examples on how cities can reinforce social policies, uh, services, but also investments, and think of everyone in our cities, especially the most disadvantaged. This campaign will continue throughout this year and the next years. And there is space and time for all cities present, any city, to join with new pledges, whether you've been joined uh, or had a pledge before or you want to start a new pledge. So just um, let us know if you're interested to uh, start a new pledge and please contribute to shape cities to be more fair and inclusive and ensure recovery for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, Bianca. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes? Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Right. So talking about cities for inclusive recovery, we're going to hear the pledges, as uh, Bianca has said, from four cities. Uh, and I'd like the uh, speakers now to join uh, me here on the stage. I shall take away. Yes, this is my, my glass. I shall take that away. So let me introduce, uh, waiting for Laura Perez. There she is. So Laura Perez, uh, Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, will present the City Pledge on Gender Equality. You're there for social services. Please take a seat here. Um, of course, everyone here knows Laura. She made the opening address yesterday at the uh, opening session. Welcome back. <laughs> Hi, how are you? So we also have Duco Sturman. Duco is uh, Director of Social Services of Amsterdam, and you'll be presenting the City Pledge on Improving Mental Health and Well-Being. Great to have you here. Agnes Berlakovic, nice to see you here. Agnes, Director of Sof Social Services of Vienna, and you will be presenting the City Pledge on Active Support to Young People and Young Mothers in Accessing the Local Labour Market. Um, and Alejandro Lopez Perez, hola, General Coordinator of Social Welfare of Madrid, and you will be presenting the City Pledge on Housing Support and Assistance of the, for the Homeless. So I'm going to leave the stage to you. I will give you first the floor, Laura, then Duco, Agnes, and then um, Alejandro. So, leave you the floor. Morning, morning. Buenos días. Uh, Alan, it's okay for you, and I will do it. We want to talk about the effort of Council in Gender Equality. For us, when we talk about recovery in this context, but also historically, we don't understand the social recovery with uh, social justice at the center of uh, um, the council policies. If we don't do this by working structural on structural inequalities, and one of them is historically is the uh, gender inequality and uh, those that affect the LGBT um, groups. So our commitment is with uh, gender justice, and that's why we are presenting all the measures we have taken with our second plan, a commitment that talks about uh, institutional change, uh, uh, where the city council, through its budget, through uh, its acknowledgments and the merits of women themselves is changing the dynamics to include gender impact of uh, public policies. Later, we will talk about um, um, feminist economics where caring and reproductive economy is placed at the center of the consideration in public policies. Uh, strengthening caring services to prevent an, uh, an extra load for women and all the policies that are related to gender transversality, a commitment with sport, culture, education, urban planning and with a gender point of view because we know women are impacted by every single um, uh, decision so this is a commitment also in our budget. This pledge is a firm commitment by the City Council of Barcelona. It's on. Uh, good morning. Um, I will do it in Dutch, and I hope the translators here will translate it very easily. But um, I will try it also in English. It's not my native language, but we will we'll try. Thank you for this opportunity, um, a pledge to the European Pillar of Social Rights. And I'm delighted to be here and to be able to connect with everyone during these um, difficult and unprecedented times. 
Um, it's a new crisis, the Ukrainian crisis, but we, we still sort of uh, managing the, 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 the COVID crisis. And the, the coronavirus and the restrictions put to place to combat the pandemic have been dom dominating our re real reality of, of day. It had an immense impact on the lives of our citizens, in specific our citizens' mental well-being has been challenged heavily. Within the first year of the corona outbreak, one in three Amsterdamers were experiencing stress, anxiety and loneliness due to the subsequent new reality day of life. The corona pandemic has reminded us that mental health and resilience are essential for people to live healthy lives and for children to grow up in good health. In times of crisis like these, it's therefore especially important to strengthen our citizens' resilience and protect their mental well-being wherever we can. We, as cities, cannot fight these kinds of psychological challenges alone. This is why, by the end of 2019, we initiated our mental health movement called Thrive Mental Health Amsterdam. In this movement, we collaborated with our residents, researchers, policymakers, healthcare professionals, and people with personal experience with mental health issues. By joining forces with all these partners, we aim to make a first step towards a resilient city in which welfare prevails and people can mentally thrive. The pandemic has boosted our efforts into me mental well-being. From late 2019 until late 2022, we have invested uh, 2 million a year in increasing the individual self-efficacy of our citizens and encouraging solidarity in the network around them. In our approach, we focus on three specific groups. Young people, a group where much can be gained when it comes to prevention. Two, the people with migration background, in generally more vulnerable group, which is often underrepresented in healthcare. And three, employers and, and business owners, a key partner in early detection and adequate referral. As a result of our movement, all Amsterdamers can now make use of mental health first aid. The first aid course trains participants to recognize mental health issues at an early stage and offers them a framework of action for referral. Moreover, professionals can now follow a so-called gatekeeper training, a course which offers them communicative tools for interacting with people who, for example, express suicidal thoughts. By pledging to the European pillar of social rights, I first of all want to stress the importance of our role as cities in guaranteeing mental health among our citizens. Secondly, I want to express our commitment to improve the mental well-being of our citizens of Amsterdam. Our ambition is that, with is that we have contributed to a significant degree of Amsterdamers withdrawing from school, work or society as a result of mental problems by 2030. And that by 2030 we have increased the insight and the risk factors and protective factors for mental issues among all, uh, all Amsterdamers in schools, organizations and communities. And thereby create a safe, healthy and supportive environment. Finally, I would look to use this opportunity to ask the European institution for support, especially with the upcoming year of mental health in 2023. With our willingness and efforts to stimulate the early identification of mental problems and adequate referral and the right support where needed, we can make a change and make for a more resilient and healthier future for all. Thank you. Good morning. Firstly, I want to start with conveying the greetings of the mayor of the city of Vienna, Mr. Michael Ludwig, and the city of Vienna's executive city councillor for social affairs, public health and sports, Peter Hacker, who unfortunately cannot be here today. My name is Agnes Belakovic and I'm head of the social department of the city of Vienna. And it's really a pleasure to me to be here and present to you this fifth City of Vienna pledge to the European Pillar of Social Right, now to the commit, is in commitment to principle four, active support to employment. It's not only in one's personal interest, but also in the interest of the whole society to enable as many people as possible to permanently provide for their living on their own. The foundations for this are laid in the youth. Therefore, it is crucial to provide young people 
with early and effective support to help them to find their way into the labor market should such support be needed. The creation of the U25 service center started when we saw that the number of unemployed young people who received social benefits started to increase, also in comparison to other targets, group, target groups who received social benefits. So we then conducted an in-depth problem analysis. And this analysis has highlighted in particular the problem that young people and young adults get partly lost between our institutions and show a high dropout rate from support schemes while simultaneously having a strong need for assistance. So we concluded that young people need more support and assistance in order to enable them to live a self-determined life and also their sustainable integration into the labor market. Uh, the goal of offering the best possible support and assistance to young people is the coverstone, cornerstone of the creation of our U25 service center. With this center, the regional public employment service and the regional social authorities now offer as a one-stop shop personalized advisory and support services in one location. So former we had 18 centers and now we have one. So we move together um, from our other offices and that's a huge building. So there was the idea and we made a project and now it's a huge building. So we are working on nearly 13,000 square meters. We work for 29,000 young people with 365 employees. It's in the joint service center and it's responsible for issues of employment, education, career and social matters. And it's available for young unemployed people aged 15 to 25 with or not, whether they are or not receiving social benefits. And uh, at the operational level, these young people are offered tailor-made support through a central case management, coordinated advisory and support services, follow-up social work and small cross-organizational multi-professional teams. They have one advisor who helps them with their problems. And it was very important that we launched our work during the crisis, so we moved there in June 20, and the rest of the centers moved there in January 21, because young people were particularly affected by COVID crisis and were faced with additional obstacles. And we were then able to offer them targeted support and assistance right away. So, it's really a chance because we, by working together, we learn more about this special group, this special important group of our, for our work, and we can identify problems and work together in projects on these problems. Uh, for example, we now started a new project for young mothers to support them by partic in participating in the labor market. And I think that's also an example for Caring Cities. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'm very happy to be with all of you sharing in person a meeting between European cities. Thanks, thanks to Euro Cities for the organization and to Barcelona for the welcome. I'm going to present our pledge uh, on accommodation and assistance to homeless people. Sorry, I will continue in Spanish. El Ayuntamiento de Madrid comparte lo. Madrid City Council shares the commitments by the uh, Lisbon Declaration because it considers homelessness uh, an extreme manifestation of social exclusion. Assistance to homeless people has been evolving in Madrid, adapting the available resources to the needs and characteristics specific of people uh, that's, that are homeless. 
in 2018, there were more than almost, almost 3,000 people, homeless people, This reality meant a turning point for the city to fight homelessness. In 2019, we adopted the Homeless Bill of Rights to eradicate the homelessness situation and to guarantee the basic rights of homeless people. The key is to reach this commitment were developed through three strategic lines, working with a preventive uh, look creating dedicated resources, resources and applying new technologies and a basic right um, focus. That's why we decided more than the, the 2,000 um, spaces with 200 more spaces for homeless people, 180 new spaces in, for dwellings, and focusing on dwelling with an investment above 6 million euros. We also adapted our assistance centers of the municipal network by starting specific projects intervening in aspects such as reducing the damages in the centers with control consumption, the intervention programs for people with pets so that homeless people could access these centers with pets and with secure programs for homeless women with an investment of 13 million euros and by the creation of specific resources for new profiles we had detected, such as women and homeless women and youth people, young people, to prevent uh, vulnerable situations, and such as the new Triagalindo centers for homeless women, which are victims of gender violence. This center has uh, multidisciplinary uh, staff that guarantees a safe environment for women Regarding the assistance for young people, we provided specific resources with a preventive uh, um, focus. So the investment in Madrid uh, is um, above 26 million euros. This places Madrid with one of the cities with uh, more places for homeless people and with an increase of these places based on methodologies um, re related to dwellings and housing. We are drafting a plan incorporating the opinions of homeless people. They aspire to have the same rights and it must be as any other citizen in Madrid. Citizen, the citizens need to commit with homeless people and they must not be left behind. very much to all of you. So Laura Perez, Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, talking about the pledge on gender equality. This is the third pledge of Barcelona after the pledges you've made on housing support and the minimum income. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Duco Sturman from Amsterdam talking about the city pledge on improving mental health and well-being. And this is the third pledge also of Amsterdam after the Pledge on Education and Equal Opportunities. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> Agnes Berlakovic talking about the need to address the problems uh, of mothers, young mothers, to access the local labor market and also for young people. And this, as you said, uh, Agnes, is the fifth, fifth pledge from Vienna after the pledges on gender equality, childcare, housing support, and access to essential services. Alejandro Lopez Perez talking about assistance for homeless people and housing support for them. And this is the fourth pledge from Madrid after the pledges on gender equality, childcare, and active support to employment. Thank you also to you. So now we, uh, so you, you have your city pleasures here framed, and I'd like to ask the photographer to come and take a picture of our, our wonderful uh, uh, city pleasures here. So I think, uh, and for the rest of us, we have a coffee break, uh, but please stay until the pictures are taken.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more photographs? Just <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this coffee served outside. Please be back at 10:45 for the high-level panel discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah.
And then, of course, your colleagues. or
Yo, you should. Could we no? get yeah. and, the, and then this? No. See, si. and then this part. Si, si, si. Gracias. Ah, Gracias. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back from the tea and coffee break. Yeah, no, you can. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. That. You can, you can ask about it. Sorry to interrupt your conversations, but we're now going into it. a very, very interesting high-level panel discussion about the issues we've been talking about, about caring cities, their priorities, their Are objectives, sure? and how people the, in uh, different parts of you know, the, the working world can work together, national governments, institutions, um, city stakeholders, etc. So uh, we have a fantastic hour and a half ahead. So I really want to get started. Um, so once again, uh, first thing that I have to say to all of, all of you, you do know how to use Slido, because we're going to be using Slido quite often during this hour and a half. So hands up those who know how to use Slido, want to use Slido, and will be using Slido. More, more, more. Come on, guys. We need you to be on Slido. Can you start going through the Slido? I've got a lo lovely group of people here who are going to go on Slido, but I want more. I want people here, too, at the back. Because really, uh, I will be taking questions, but it's always very nice to have also uh, your, your aspirations and your thoughts up on the screen. So please scan, 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 and get there. OK. So as I said, um, welcome back. Once again, housekeeping is simple. Uh, live streamed. Hello, everyone. Hello also, by the way, for the people up there. I am so delighted you're here as well. Uh, and I hope you find this also informative and inspiring. So we're going to talk about how cities can contribute to transforming care systems uh, to become more equitable, non-discriminatory, and inclusive for all times, especially in times of crisis. Um, yesterday, we were told during the official opening about, you know, how just as we were hoping to recover from the pandemic, we were hit by the war in Europe and how that is changing, making systemic changes. Uh, our solidarity with the Ukrainians, their fight for democracy is our fight for democracy as well. But also the impact that the war is having across the world, but also here in Europe and of course impacting on our city leadership and our city plans and, and policies. So the first, the first Slido question is, what does a caring city mean to you? And thank you everyone for coming in. This is amazing. So inclusion. Empathy, absolutely, solidarity, uh, equal rights, equity, very important to talk about equity, not just equality, but equity, so people get what they need, the circumstances they live in, social rights, solidarity, enabling community, and let's have a look, quality of life, action on the ground, responsibility, etc. Very, very good. Thank you so much for participating in this. Um, now let me uh, introduce you to uh, the wonderful Blanca Garces Macarenas. Excuse my pronunciation, but I think I got it right. Yeah, years of speaking or trying to speak Spanish. Um, she's a senior research fellow in migrants and research coordinator at the Barcelona Center for International Affairs, CEDOP, with which I've also worked, and I'm really proud of that as well. So, Blanca, you will be setting the scene for our panel debate, and you'll be talking about the role of cities in organizing care services to respond to the current urgent needs. Um, I'll give you the floor. Please come here and... Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. Thanks to Ana and Tia for the excellent organization. Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, has led um, to one of the fastest exodus since World War II. In two months, uh, more than six million people has crossed the border to seek refuge uh, in the European Union. This is not the first European refugee crisis, but it's different. Why is it different? First of all, there are, of course, objective uh, differences, the geographical proximity, relatively good means of transport, visa-free uh, access for Ukrainian uh, citizens, 
and of course as well, and this is important, the existence of a support network at the other side of the border. But the response from the European Union has also been different. While at the end of 2015, the European Union made it clear that it was no longer willing to take any more refugees, this time, though the numbers are much higher, this time we have, uh, we have an open door policy. Countries like Poland and Hungary, traditionally reluctant to immigration, have become the main receiving countries. It's thus no surprise that member states agreed to implement the Temporary Protection director, Directive for the first time. This means that in contrast to the rest of asylum seekers, refugees fleeing Ukraine are given immediate access to international protection with all the rights that this implies. It means as well that Ukrainian refugees can choose their country of residence without the limits imposed by the arbitrary criteria of the Dublin system. From an international point of view, this crisis is also different. It implies geopoliticizing asylum again. During the Cold War, in a world divided in two, in two blocks, the reception of refugees had an, an ideological value for the West it was another way of discrediting the communist model and presenting itself as its antithesis, emphasizing solidarity and the guarantee of rights. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, refugees stopped having this moral plus. It's thus no surprise that in the 90s, the international asylum regime became more restrictive and precarious. In a nutshell, my argument is that with less geopolitics, fewer refugees. Now, geopolitics are back. The extraordinary reception of the Ukrainian refugees is explained not only by the geographical and cultural proximity of the refugees, as it has often been argued, it has to do as well with the fact that it's a symbolic and profoundly normative confrontation between two worlds. The West, which presents itself as the guarantor of democracy and rights, and Russia, an autocratic and illiberal regime that also defies the European and international security order. This is how the reception of refugees has gained, or let's say has regained again, an, ide an ideological or moral value. But cities don't know about geopolitics. I would say, and this is my main argument, that cities are different. Cities have other priorities, other priorities than states, often regardless of their ideological stances. I'm saying this to you today, but in fact, this argument, this reflection, comes from a quite central academic debate that has taken place in the last couple of decades. Let me explain why we scholars think that cities are different by nature. First of all, and this is the first difference, while the nation state rules a territory, cities rule over people. While the national community identifies itself with a territory, making the defense of these territorial borders also a defense of us, of us against them, of us against those who are at the other side of the border. In contrast, cities are, by definition, spaces crossed by high levels of mobility. In other words, cities have no borders. Cities are constituted by people who live there in a particular moment in time. And as a result, and this is the second difference, urban citizenship, citizenship understood in its broader sense of membership, is by definition more inclusive. The urban citizen is anyone who lives in the city, no matter the origin, the socioeconomic position, or the legal status. While the concept of national citizenship is exclusionary by nature, defining by definition insiders and outsiders, those who have the right to have rights and those who don't, the limits of urban citizenship are much more blurred. 
And finally, and this is the third difference, cities are also different when we refer to security. While migration policies are often justified or legitimized, in, particularly in its securitization drift, by the fear to others and the protection of us against them, cities know from experience that long-term security can only be achieved by including everyone. Cities know from experience that inclusion, and therefore rights, is the other side of security, while exclusion is the seat of tomorrow's conflict. Cities know it. So in a nutshell, I would argue, and here I know that I'm a little bit strong and maybe a little bit provocative, that cities are caring by nature. They cannot afford not to take care of their citizens, of anyone who lives there. Because basically, not taking care of them, of all, means not taking care of all, of the whole city. Thus, for local administrations, it could mean to fail in accomplishing its most central duties. And finally, what should these differences mean in the current refugee crisis? As you have agreed, in the, European, in the Eurocities statement on caring cities and solidarity with all refugees, I would say that these differences mean basically four things, or at least for me mean four things. First of all, cities are, and you know it already, central in the reception of refugees despite not having competences on asylum. This means that their central role should be acknowledged at the EU level, but also, but also at the national level. They should be key partners, not only in the implementation of reception policies, but also in their design, or let's say in their redesign in this changing context. Being key, being central, means as well being funded. Cities need extra funds from the EU and national level. Second point. Cities, cities, given its nature, given all the differences I have just pointed out, cannot afford to make differences between refugees, between Ukrainian nationals and the rest, all fleeing Ukraine, between those fleeing Ukraine and the rest of refugees and asylum seekers, fleeing as well war and persecution. Making differences mean including and excluding, protecting and disprotecting. In short, it would mean increasing inequalities, producing marginalization, and crafting destitution. As I said, cities cannot afford it. Third point, national governments cannot afford it either. The simple existence and recognition of differences among asylum seekers calls, in fact, into question the very geopoliticization of asylum. If states, in this ideological and normative contest, as I just explained at the beginning of my presentation, if states present themselves as guarantors of democracy and rights, no distinction at all should be made. Cities should, and this is the third point, remind this to their national states. Other th once, th once think, um, one thing we learned from 2015 refugee uh, reception crisis is in fact that cities matter. That cities matter beyond its own territory. Cities can push, can pressure their own governments, and if they do it together, nationally, but also at the European and international level, they may have more chances to succeed. And my fourth and last point, as Eurocities has shown for many years, cities can matter at the EU and in international level. Therefore, cities, and in this case, European cities, are key also in the context of the current war in Ukraine. Important, key to provide humanitarian aid, key to support other cities in Ukraine, but also close to the border, key to work for peace, to receive and welcome refugees, and key to think about the future at the international level on how to make the world a more secure one, and at the local level on how to make this crisis an opportunity for constructing better caring cities for all its citizens without exception. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Blanca. That was such a powerful speech and so well explained. As somebody who's been following these issues for some time with a great deal of disillusionment and sadness, I think you've made some things very clear, and I really appreciate, and I think all of us absolutely appreciate your analysis and the fact that you've said cities matter. And the fact that you call the 2015 so-called migration crisis a reception crisis, which is exactly what it was. Um, I think it's a great start to our panel, to our panel discussion now. And I'm going to launch it with another Slido question. We're doing this and you've been so well responsive. I also saw that one person said, was a caring city mean to you? And the response was love which is a word that we don't use often enough, perhaps, in today's world. So uh, let me now ask the second slider question, uh, which is, what are the key challenges of your care system? Um, and uh, we bef while we get the results in, let me ask our panelists to come and join me here, up here on this wonderful stage. So uh, Laura, Laura Perez, uh, Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, please come and join us here. Um, Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, let's, let's give Laura a hand again. Uh, this is mine. Yeah. Uh, also ask Aldona Makninovska Gora to come, uh, Deputy Mayor of Warsaw. There you are, Aldona. Dominique Bay from the DG Employment from the European Commission, Social Affairs and Inclusion. Kim van Sparentak, member of the European Parliament. Please join us also. And uh, last but not least, Philip Corey, Region, Deputy Regional Director for UNICEF, up here as well. Right, thank you very much. Now, I, I, great, so you guys can also now see the responses that are coming in when I ask what, does, uh, what are the key challenges of your care system. And I think this will also uh, enable us to take our conversation forward. Um, and you see 47% think it's insufficient workforce to match the growing demand. I think it's a very, very powerful <laughs> point and message. The second one, oh, that goes up to more than, yeah, we're reaching more than 50%, unequal access. Too costly, not affordable for everyone. Underinvestment, also a message there. Quality issues and gender equality issues as well. So um, these are some of the key points that have been highlighted by everyone here in this room. Thank you for your participation. And uh, we'll go back to Slido uh, as we go into our conversation. So I'm going to ask all of you really, uh, wonderful panelists, one key question, and I want you to answer from the heart, because what I liked about Blanca's uh, message also was it was a mixture of very good intellectual analysis, but also I think it came from a very good place inside your heart. So thank you very much for that. So the question for everyone really is, which priorities should, well, we talked about this yesterday, right? Where the commissioner, Nicola Schmidt, talked about the European care strategy. And the question I have to all of you starting off now, given all the circumstances we're living in, all the questions that are on our agenda, um, what should be the priorities of this uh, upcoming European care strategy. And I'm going to start with you, Lara, give you the floor first, please. And we all have, we're all, you, you, you're not equipped? It was painful. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. Fine. <laughs> but if no you problem. can listen to me, it's okay. Yes, like yes, this. we can hear you. Then thank you very much. Um, parlo en català. So I will speak in Catalan. I will make use of Translation. Good. So, I believe it's worth to start with a reflection on the regulatory framework of care and um, the deficiencies in the Spanish framework, also in relation in regard to some of the ideas given by the previous speaker and also by the reflection you were having in the room regarding the uh, 
an equal access to care, and I would uh, to care, and I would not just say an equal care, but also excluding care. We're living, we're experiencing this in a contradictory way with the arrival of people. In the case of Barcelona, at least, people coming from Ukraine and the social protection uh, given by Europe to the states and in the cities. We know that we've got residents. We've had residents for years waiting for this recognition of their asylum situation and uh, refugee situation, refugee status, and therefore social protection which emerges from this recognition. So it's not just an equal in terms of uh, income, that's obvious, but there's also an exclusion, a direct exclusion under this uh, sustaining regulatory framework. In the case of Spain, with this uh, law on foreigners, which points basically to the uh, coverage of a part related to the emergency, but not with all the rights of citizenship all citizens have. So we already have first class residents and second class residents in our citizens when and, and when they have to access the social protection system and the care system. This is an impact on social services mainly, and given that we've got uh, quite a few representatives of social services here. Secondly, we need to discuss the productive part, the workforce part of care. This is a very precarious sector. Also, there is uh, many women uh, coming from abroad in an irregular situation and they're working on care in a very precarious situation. There are some uh, um, collective agreements, uh, but uh, in the case of Catalonia, but also the state of Spain has not recognized uh, the collective agreement 189 by which the uh, house workers are integrated into the social security system and are allowed to have pensions and sick leaves and the like. The state, the Spanish government, is working on it, but uh, it's not being effective yet, yet, so they are not protected. And in Barcelona, we've discussed that the right to be taken care of cannot go against the rights of the caregivers. And some of us will be visiting Barcelona Cuida this afternoon. This is a center that wants to accompany house workers and caregivers, care workers, and support them in their rights. Yes, with legal support, but also with uh, psychological support, because we understand the stress that comes from a work such as caring for sick people, old people, dependent people, and um, also people that eventually leave you, which has an impact on the emotional link beyond the work. So we need to demand more uh, rigid, uh, more rigid uh, framework, regulatory framework, because this Europe is now excluding residents from our cities. And the statement in the opening session yesterday, we made it clear, and Blanca was also saying it, we cities have different perceptions because on our, our daily routine is uh, set by the needs of our residents, uh, regardless of their administrative situation. The European strategy for equality between men and women is also integrating care and uh, also a recognition of the feminist uh, theoretical basis. And Europe is giving us signs, I believe, and probably we should require, we should demand that the European frameworks with dialogue and their ability to impact states ensure the top social coverage to all the citizenship and we must not forget that care is part of our economy i believe actually that uh, it should be accounted for in the gdp the reproductive economy and what it means it will make visible what's the actual contribution of the economy the, the economy of care and these hours which are not accounted for not paid and uh, with the regulatory framework in Europe, we could make progress. But also the caregivers have rights, and the right to be taken care of cannot go beyond the rights uh, and on top of the rights of people who take care of others.
very much indeed, Lara. So pointing very strongly to the stress that caregivers live under and the need for their contribution, uh, not just to society, but also to the economy and possibly to politics also to be taken into account when we look at the upcoming European care strategy. So I'm sure there will be some more points we can develop uh, as we go along, but a very good starting point. Aldona, so um, the same question for you about the upcoming European care strategy, but obviously Warsaw uh, has been in the forefront of receiving refugees from Ukraine. Um, I was there, I teach at the College of Europe in Natalin, and I saw even at the college uh, in Natalin there were Ukrainian refugees coming there and you know people were volunteering. It's been a lot of volunteering, right, from people and, and uh, organizations. Sometimes really. I think that all of us are volunteers in Poland, <laughs> because it's incredible that uh, we, we, could, we could manage it and help people yeah. in this time, in such a short time, such a huge number of uh, refugees. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's really something that everyone has noticed and, and, and been really moved by. So from your point of view, the European care strategy. Uh, let me in the beginning uh, say thank you you to the cities from Euro cities and to you because I know that during this crisis a lot of people were uh, called to our officials and giving uh, uh, of offered uh, help and asking about what it's in uh, uh, what we are doing in Warsaw and how to help and believe me it was very important to us because we felt that we are not alone that we are not alone mm -hmm. and uh, it, it made us stronger so let me say thank you uh, it was very important Important, and I think this is this kind of cooperation, and collaboration, and friendship is very important in such a crisis. It's uh, not uh, not only between people, between uh, cities, between nations. It's it's a kind of solidarity. It's, it's I, I think it's important. It was and will very important because uh, we are at the turning point. Uh, I think so at a very difficult moment historically, economically, politically. Uh, when you talk about strategy and uh, new priorities, uh, uh, priorities, we have to remember what moment it is. We are after two years of pandemic and uh, nobody, uh, in fact, cannot be sure it will be not be back. So uh, we know that during this time how important and how uh, uh, very important was health system and uh, social system to manage with this crisis. And I think that uh, the, the social system and the health system is stronger after this, uh, after this uh, crisis. Uh, of course, we have our old uh, uh, changes, aging, discrimination, uh, challenges, aging, discriminations, human rights, women rights, uh, and we still have to worry about it. It all adds up to the largest refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War. We always are talking about it, but believe me, it's not a war near the border of Europe. I'm sure it's a border in Europe. When I was at the uh, railway stations with refugees in these first weeks, it was really like a war. You know, one, one night uh, uh, I met a young woman, 27 years old, with 80 years uh, daughter, with mother, and six days baby on, in her arms. It's a war. It's incredible. And it's, a, of course, heartbreaking one story. But the stories, it's thousands hundred thousands millions and of course we I think that we not be sh we ha haven't be sure that it's now it's uh, finished because we don't know what we mm -hmm. do in the future with this man with, with Putin with the war in the Ukraine with, with uh, Belarus we don't know who, what what will be in the future so what we can uh, uh, say that the future is uncertain unpredictable unknown if we could prepare for this. I think that, in fact, no. We couldn't be prepared for pandemic, in fact. We couldn't be prepared for, uh, uh, for uh, the war. Prepare us, uh, plan some, some system, plan some strategy exactly for this point. So maybe we should uh, think about this, about crisis in the future, crisis which are there. Uh, that the, the most important uh, are the people, social cohesion, civil society, and values they bring for it. Uh, 
we need to build system based on international solidarity between cities and between people, solidarity at the international, but in the inter, in, interpersonal level as well, support civil society and non-government orga organization more strongly, and of course build, build alliances, intergenerational and intercultural, and I think that it's most important to uh, in the future to uh, keep this social cohesion, which is fro so fragile in my opinion, and maybe fragile, more fragile in the future. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Aldona. The need for solidarity and the fact how uh, buoyed and uh, heartened you were by the messages, but also the efforts of solidarity, but also uh, pointing, I think, very importantly to the dangers ahead as well, because, as you said, we don't know how long the war will last. Yeah. Um, we don't know the geopolitical repercussions of it, but also the repercussions within the EU in terms of our financing ability, what we'll be able to uh, cope in terms of money, first of all, also, but also in terms of reception, I think, if this war goes on. So thank you very much, Aldona. So Dominique, um, coming to you, uh, your commissioner already yesterday set the tone and gave us a kind of hope, I think, to many people taking part in the Social Affairs Forum that at least he would push the agenda as uh, EuroCities and all our colleagues here are pushing for, hoping for. But what we need to know from you actually is, given the current circumstances, the fragility of our social systems, our health systems, uh, the impact of refugees coming in, uh, what can we expect from the European care package? Okay, first I would like to thank the city representatives. So both uh, Laura and Aldona gave us feedback from the ground, which is very useful when at EU level we start uh, designing new strategies, and I think it's very useful for you also, Kim, to see, uh, to get the feedback from the reality. The title of the, this session is about in times of crisis, but in fact it's crisis with an S, because we have had COVID crisis first, no, the uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis, and tomorrow, most likely, an economic crisis, which will have a social impact, which will be quite uh, important. So w when we start designing strategies, we need to, to take all of this into account. And what came out of the, the COVID crisis first, no, the Ukrainian crisis, and tomorrow, most likely, the poverty crisis that is likely to occur given the, the, highs, the, the fact that prices for energy, for food, for many supplies which are basic supplies increase f quickly and faster than in incomes, is to, to look at the, what, is, what are the structural factors and what is behind all of this is uh, the demographic change. If we look back at, at the COVID crisis and how it impacted the care system, it was mostly older people who were most affected by COVID, and it's the fact that Europe has a large number of older people that, make, that pushed the care systems to the edge of collapse. And so this, this kind of uh, analysis needs to be taken into account when designing the new strategy. We cannot just, uh, of course, there are emergencies, and for this we can act quickly, and this is what the Commission has done, and the EU has done in general, providing flexibility to let refugees come easily or fast in, within the EU without all the administrative barriers which fa were faced by previous refugees, and at the same time, providing cash. But this is short term. If we look at the longer term, we need to consider that the, the way the care system is designed today is still kind of care system of the 1960s, when um, people were much younger, including us, and when the needs were different. Now we get into a society on one side where let's say, a third of the, uh, of the population is, can be seen as older, and at the same time it means less people able to, and that was the first line 
in uh, the, the Slido, uh, the main challenge is to find people to do the job and to provide care. So th this has to be taken into account. So yesterday the Commissioner already gave a comprehensive description of what is in the pipeline, but it will clearly be driven by this kind of analysis, structural analysis, and not just reacting to one crisis because we don't know what will come in six months. Honestly, we are in a phase where ev things, everything, I mean, who would have said in a SAF that would have taken place in January that we would be discussing re Ukrainian refugees today? It's only, we are only a few months, less than six months later, the picture has changed totally. So we need to have a system which is resilient. And of course, sometimes we are overwhelmed, but it was even clearer with the, the COVID crisis that we were not prepared. And having a pandemic was something that could well happen, but we kind of pushed it on the side and saying, it will not happen, we are modern, we are beyond this, we are in digital and in other issues, but we kind of dismissed that health issues can still be, uh, can still block the, the economy. So to, to uh, cut here, I would say having a, a it will, the strategy will need to be based on a structural analysis. Mm. So basically, uh, Dominique, you're talking about, if I understand it correctly, the challenge between dealing with the structural problems of an aging society and the, and the burden it puts on social systems and health systems, but at the same, same time being adaptable enough to respond to crisis, you use the word resilience. Mm. I just have a, I'm curious and I have a question. So, you know, this is not the last pandemic unfortunately, that we live through. I mean, the world is globalized, interdependent, interconnected. Um, are we preparing in part of the care strategy, will it be also to sort of beef up our, our systems for the next one? Of course, you never get twice the same crisis. So it's, you learn from the previous one. Uh, you, I think in the previous one, the COVID crisis told us that this can happen. And uh, say again, three years ago, nobody would have imagined that something like this would ever happen in our lifetime. So this was a wake-up call that this can happen. And then one needs to, to, to have scenarios and mm -hmm. to be able to say, if something like this happens again, what shall we do? Again, honestly, when the COVID crisis started, nobody knew what to do and it, the, the there was no proper strategy. It has been quite erratic finding a way to advance. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we got vaccination very quickly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would still be wearing masks or we would not be here, we would be online. Mm -hmm. So that was, but clear, we were taken by events and we were not able to uh, manage them. I think at least this has been in the mind of people more and one can expect that next time there, there will be a strategy ready in case something like this happens, but it could also be that we have a, a, a quick, and this is kind of coming, a quick acceleration of climate change. How will, uh, shall we react to this? So this is another kind of uh, massive uh, crisis that can, can strike us. So I indeed, this, this is, but we can only be prepared in terms of having the structures in place uh, to have, in the case of COVID, enough uh, beds in hospitals. Mm. This has made a huge difference when you see uh, between countries, some countries were totally overwhelmed, others could manage, but at the basis they had kept, they had been a bit slower in reforming the, the health care system, mm. so they still had uh, too many beds, but which came very useful in that case. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, very, very important words. I mean, we live in a very interconnected world and obviously climate change is having a big impact also on mobility. People are, you know, temperatures are rising, drought in, in Africa, food shortages, and I expect there will be, unfortunately for them, because it's not easy to leave home and travel millions of miles away, thousands of miles away, but there would be also an increase in influx of people um, uh, fleeing climate change, not just, uh, uh, not just uh, civil wars uh, or real wars, not just civil wars. Civil wars are also real wars, but I mean between countries, um, not within countries. 
So I guess it's important to have all the silos connected in a sense. So I guess that brings me to you, Kim, um, because the European Parliament has a very important role to play in formulating policies within the EU. And I wanted to hear your input on the care strategy and what will be the priorities of someone like yourself working in the European Parliament as a member of Parliament. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you also very much already to the other speakers. Um, well, if we look at you know where we are standing right now, indeed, we are in a crisis. Um, but I think if we are really honest, we were already on the brink of crisis before the pandemic started and before the war started. Um, people couldn't already afford their homes anymore. People were already put in care facilities that weren't proper, where there weren't enough hands on the beds, um, and um, everything was based on a calculation on how many beds we would need with how many people, and if that was actually not based on how we would work in practice, because someone might need a bit of extra help um, getting out of bed in the morning, yeah, that didn't fit in the pure calculation uh, way that we are organizing our care world right now. So I think what we need to do, and also this is what, what the European Parliament is calling for, at least the Greens are, and I hope we will be calling for it soon as well, is really a true care deal for Europe. Because if we look at what happened during the pandemic, we said, okay, actually health is the most important for everyone without being healthy, we you know, cannot thrive in our societies. We have to make sure that people who aren't healthy get the support they need to live a full and happy life as well. And we suddenly said, okay, we stop our focus on pure economic growth and we start looking at how we can make our economy based on care. We have a society that is based on caring for each other, where we are uh, very lenient towards people who uh, say, I have to stay home to take care of someone. And now we, in some countries, have declared the pandemic over. It's not over yet, um, but we are going back to normal. And we're also going back to the aspect of looking purely at the calculations, how many people do we need at the beds, and can we just um, you know, have a little bit more profit out of the different care facilities in our society. And if we've collectively applauded the frontline workers, I think we really have to make sure that these people get to the core of our society and that we appreciate them, not only by applauding, by making sure that they get paid well to make sure that they get what they deserve when they're working in these really tough jobs, where they are actually sac sacrificing their lives and well-being for the well-being of others. And we see that structurally people who are working in the care sector are underpaid and undervalued. And these are primarily women. There's also a strong gender aspect to this. And this is one of the core things that need to change. We have to invest more in the people working in the care sector. But next to that, we see that, you know, Europe has been the place where we said, if there's something that you cannot deal with yourself, we will take care of you. We will make sure that there's childcare facilities where your kids can be safe, where there's enough people watching over your kids. We will make sure that um, your, your grandmother, who uh, is, uh, isn't able to get out of bed herself in the morning, will get the support she needs. And this we will provide by the state. This is something we created in Europe. And now Europe has become also the place where we're privatizing everything. Everything is left to the market. Um, of course, um, I'm from the Netherlands where uh, we have a huge issue because of the system we have where we've privatized everything, um, where, things everyth where every care, uh, almost every care on a local level has to go to public procurement, which means every five years the care provider changes and very specific, very necessary, for example, youth mental health care systems and units, they are gone because they don't make it through the tender. Um, which means that there's a huge gap for, for young adults who are suffering, for example, with depression. They cannot get the proper care that they need. But also what we've seen in France um, and Belgium in the last weeks um, with Orpea, where uh, we see that also the financialization and the, 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 just the you know, capitalization of care facilities um, has created systems that are just not okay, not in a society 
um, where we say that we find it important that we care for people. So if we, may, if we want to say that we have a strong and caring Europe and a social Europe, this is what has to change. We have to make care the core of our European society and our European economy. And lastly, um, what that also means, we have to invest more. We have to invest more in public care, in public services, um, making sure that the state and cities provide for the people and actually look at whether you know, privatizing everything mm, means that it is more efficient and you get more out of it. Because it's the, this is, of course, the mantra that has been told to all of us. You know, if, we, if you have a private company that does the work, you'll get a way better uh, worth uh, for your money, uh, but in the end, it's the shareholders that get a lot of money and the worth uh, doesn't really go to the people who are in the care systems. So I think um, a lot needs to change and I think one of the main places that it has to happen, and that's also the reason why I'm here, um, is at the city level. Because um, I realize that when I speak with national governments, they often are very interested asking me how they can make sure that their companies will thrive in the European Union. And when I talk with cities, they ask me how their people can thrive. So that's why it's always very inspiring to talk with city officers here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much for making the point about the need for investments and uh, not just turning f to privatization. But you made a very important point about essential workers, the frontline workers during the pandemic. And of course, we were all out there at 8 o'clock, uh, 8 p.m. in the evening, you know, applaud. And of course, that was very necessary. But um, they need more than just that. And I think this is something that our governments are perhaps not as uh, anxious to provide. And one of the things you talked about how most of the essential workers are also women, and, and of course, that's another problem. But a lot of them were also, are also migrants. Uh, and that was one thing that the, the Joint Research Center of the EU came out with that. And I remember Commissioner Yilva Johansson pointing that out when she was talking about migration and how that was a normal uh, thing in, in life and in, in, in the world. And she pointed to the fact that, you know, I think it was really something like 75% are actually migrant workers, migrant women workers. And for a moment I thought, ah, maybe the conversation in Europe about migration will change, the demonization will change, but it did not last long, unfortunately. So thank you very much, Kim, for making that point. Philip, um, UNICEF, of course, uh, when we talk about refugees, um, Ukrainian or Syrian or Afghan, we tend to focus a lot on adults, and why not, of course. But your organization, you yourself, are very committed, of course, to the challenges, the obstacles, the dangers that um, child refugees, children face. So give us an idea of what you're doing at the moment uh, when it comes to the influx of uh, Ukrainian refugees. I know you've been traveling in the region, um, so let's hear your points of view. No, thank you, Shada. I mean, first, uh, th thank you to Barcelona and to Eurocities. I mean, we feel very important, huh? the <laughs> beauty of the place, and thank you for yeah, that. Yeah. The history and the culture, I mean, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and let me recognize first, I mean, also Warsaw, the city of Warsaw. I mean, they are on the front line. Mm. UNICEF is working basically in the hosting countries with cities, uh, financial support, technical support, supplies, with those uh, big cities or small cities at the border. Uh, and cities are really the, the front uh, fighter. Uh, and uh, we have to help their capacity in terms of kindergartens. You know, 90% of the refugees uh, are basically children and their mothers and grandmothers. This is what you saw, and Adelina mentioned it, when you, you are at the Warsaw train station, and you see this influx, you feel the energy. I mean, it's a real tragedy that is unfolding a, a, in Europe. So the first thing is, how can we, and as UNICEF, uh, where should we work? It's one refugee per second. Per second. In 20 days, we got as many refugees as in four years of war of Syria. So it gives you the magnitude, and we are actually now close uh, to 6 million refugees. 50 to um, a bit more in some countries, percent of these refugees are children. So it's really for us, it has been really an imperative, so who can help now? And cities, 
uh, were obviously already engaged and doing a lot. So we went immediately to cities. They were a bit surprised at the beginning when UNICEF knocked at the door, you know, thinking of UNICEF supporting Africa uh, and not necessarily the EU uh, countries. But we are used to humanitarian crisis and we have a whole logistics and we, this is no other way for UNICEF. Those are children and this is really for us uh, our mandate. So we went to all these cities, uh, Prague, uh, Bratislava, uh, in Poland in particular, because you have Warsaw, you have, we have also a partnership with Krakow, with Wrocław. And those are big partnerships huh, with uh, serious support. But we had to support the work they were already engaged in. It was amazing what these people have done. Uh, but you know, sometime, I mean, uh, yesterday in the session with the commissioner, or even today, there were some issues, you know, in terms of funding not being available at the time you need it to hire people to multiply your, your kindergarten so that, you know, all these mothers could finally breathe, even mentally, because their children would be safe and their children would get, again, a sense of normalcy. These children went traumatized. So it, it's quite complex to bring to the scale immediately uh, space. Uh, and I've been in so many stadiums, uh, ice skating ring, I mean, where, that were transformed into um, registration centers. And you had all these mothers and children. So uh, looking for, for support. Uh, and therefore, you need uh, you know, to organize your support through systems. Uh, a lot of generosity, amazing solidarity in Poland. I mean, I'm sure there is not even one citizen that did not support in other countries, but in Poland it was so amazing. But we all know that this generosity will have some fatigue uh, in the months to come. We already sent, uh, we saw yesterday some uh, tests, I mean, some surveys that indicate some growing and re, you know, rising tensions between communities, hosting communities and so on. We have to be really strategic about that because it's going to come uh, towards the end of the year. And you always have politically, I mean, some groups that are opportunistic. Some social media fake news business, as you all know, putting oil on the fire. Uh, and what is at stake at the end, to bring it back to uh, somehow to the care strategy, is the social cohesion of our societies. For the first time, all of us think that possibly a third world war could happen. And our work, starting with children, with our values, is perhaps a way to mitigate the impact, negative impact on the social cohesion. Social inclusion, starting with children, is an antidote uh, against the uh, attacks uh, on our social cohesion. And cities have a first role to play. And uh, I would advocate as UNICEF, obviously, as the first investment, and cities have been amazing, in the early child uh, wood time. It's the best investment you can make. Europe is the richest region in the world. But before the pandemic, before this uh, bloody war, where children are the first victim, one child out of four was already at risk of social exclusion and poverty. One out of four in the richest region in the world. That bloody cycle of poverty is being passed from one generation to the other in the richest region in the world. So we need to stop that. And investing in the early childhood care and nurturing is the best investment. So we are advocating now because the Barcelona targets are being revised from zero to three half of the children should be enrolled, or at least uh, families provided with the possibility of these acts, particularly the most uh, vulnerable families. And then 100% should be from three to six in uh, early childhood care. We know it stimulates the brain, cognitive capital. We know it's the best driver to bring communities together, to make sure, and we have seen this in many countries, we have so much evidence that it's the best investment a country, a city can do, starting early, breaking this cycle of uh, disadvantage that is transmitted from one generation to another. So my plea to you is let's continue to do good work and then no child should be left behind. Uh, and we start there. We have to build the resilience of our societies because we are not resilient for the pandemic and uh, not even for this uh, tragedy that is coming. Uh, so we need to build our resilience in a sense that it is defined by the poorest, the most vulnerable children having access to services, basic services, education, health, protection. So those are really simple things to do. And we can do now. We have the child guarantee. Uh, it, it took years and it started in the parliament, the child guarantee. But now we have governments have public uh, funding mechanism to do public policies. So they have no excuse 
not to engage in public policies that would support the migrant or refugee child, the child with disability, the child from uh, minorities like the Roma child, and the child from the poorest household. So we are privileged, and Europe has been innovative enough because no other region in the world has that financing mechanism. Believe me, it's not so difficult, not so easy, I should say, to have government take uh, on this financing facility. We work directly, I work with the Minister of uh, Family in Poland, with the Minister of Family uh, in uh, the Slovak Republic and so on, to help them to access to this funding mechanism. And we should link it more to cities. And as UNICEF, we are committed, I mean, uh, Adelina knows, to retry to connect this instrument to cities, as cities are the frontliner and perhaps the closer uh, to these vulnerable families. They know where the vulnerable families live. They know what the vulnerabilities are in their cities, in their communities, more than government. So our challenge is to connect this new instrument that we are so privileged, like the child guarantee, to have in Europe, with you know, public policies and, and, um, and cities. I mean, we do it very well in this crisis. Uh, we, we work with government. For in, we try to do an ecosystem for child protection. And it starts at the border. We are training now, the, uh, and it's the Ministry of Interior in these countries, training the uh, guards, you know, controlling the border. For the moment, when you go to the borders, you see they just look at the Ukrainian passport. Even if it's not valid, you go. But they don't look at possibilities of human trafficking situations. So we need to train them to recognize immediately the potential. Oh, this is potentially a traffic. So we are training them these guards, and training them as well to speak to children. Because children very often have information. But if you don't know how to speak to the child, you will never get that information. Is that adult actually a family member? Uh, or if you have a bus full of children, you know, what is this bus? So it starts from there up to the children, uh, kindergarten in cities, where we try to get space, work with the Ministry of Education to somehow recognize the standards, you know, sometimes it's, you know, ad hoc. So we have to be having the system recognize uh, the space uh, as, um, as a learning space, mm. as a protective space, even if the standards are not as perfect as it should be according to the Ministry of Education or Family and Social Affairs. So that connect uh, between the central government mm. uh, and, and cities is very important. And UNICEF in this crisis is doing that. The third connect is with civil society. It's so important to engage with communities. In, uh, in Poland, to take the example, we work with the Scouts, for instance. We, we believe a lot in youth uh, as agent for change. That's the time to show. And there are about 100,000 Scouts in Poland. So you can uh, mobilize that network, support this network in terms of their capacity, training, uh, because they are in station, train station, they are the border. So we need to build this ecosystem with government, central services, and I gave one example of a, uh, you have uh, also police, you have also firemen, but also cities with their own infrastructures and civil society. UNICEF is taking this opportunity to really make the system for children in these countries stronger. Mm -hmm. So that's really at the end when we hope, all of us, that the war will end. The system for children in all these countries, we we have invested in it, it will be stronger, whether it's central, decentralized, and civil society system. So that's the way we see it. And for cities where we cannot work directly because they are not ne necessarily at the border, like many of your cities, we propose with EuroCities to do a platform of technical support where you could be online having webinars and a sharing of experience around the refugee crisis, very specific. How do you organize a psychosocial uh, you know, system for these children? How, what are the best practices? How do you work on this learning space? Because, uh, and that will be my last point, uh, it's a complex crisis. You know, we work in Ukraine for 25 years, um, both sides, a child is a child. I was in Donbass myself in, in, uh, in December. And they are telling us, those are our children. So imagine 7.5 million children, already 5 million are gone, or displaced one way or the other. As a nation, you will be rightfully very worried that all your children, all your future is gone in other countries. So we need, and UNICEF facilitates that, to connect the government and the cities with the hosting systems so that, you know, they don't lose track. And I heard yesterday, they, I mean, they are quite organized. They continue their learning digitally. It's a very digitalized nation, Ukraine. 
So it's very important that we also understand these multiple pathways of learning so that we allow them to continue their digital learning because they need to go their degree to, for their degree. And, and they have a very high level in science compared to the European children, uh, I, I was told, in many instances. So we need to uh, continue to nurture that progress for development of these kids through <coughs> this capacity of being in a classroom in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Poland and elsewhere, by having the possibility to learn, perhaps Slovak, Polish, Hungarian, but to continue right. also their own learning system. So that, that's very important very because it's, if it's not done, we're making you know, a, a huge mistake there in terms of the integration. So that's really my last point on that one, because it's more complex than it looks. Uh, and similarly for protection, uh, disabil uh, children with disability, the, the social affairs you know, minister of Ukraine said, please help us to connect with those ministries of cities that have some of our children with disabilities, because Ukraine was having the largest uh, population of children in institutions, 91,000. So, of course, I in this context, you had a lot of religious associations taking these kids without control. Now it is controlled. So we need to have this connect system, you know, inter-system, so that we, we really have a larger uh, ecosystem for child protection. Thank and you. cities are playing a big role. Thank you, because I can go on and on. And I <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Philippe, uh, your commitment and your passion for this is amazing, and I've worked with you on some of these questions of child guarantee and also social exclusion. Uh, leaving no child behind, and all of these questions are so fundamental to uh, our societies and the future of our societies. So I didn't want to cut you off <laughs> deliberately, but I am under uh, scheduling sort of deadlines, you know. So thank you very much um, for that first round. Uh, I think we have a Slido question uh, ready for us now as well. Um, which priority should the upcoming European care strategy address? And we had that result is here, so, um, and uh, Dominique, you mentioned it, and we are, I think it's quite good to take a, a screenshot of this and keep it in our minds. Um, right, thank you very much indeed. So now I'm going to open uh, for a quick uh, interactive session with, with, with you, so if you have any questions, uh, please put up your hand. But I've also got Abbasia Hakem, Deputy Mayor of Nantes, um, who has a, a word to say, because you've been also talking a lot about these questions in Nantes. Um, may I give you the floor? <laughs> no? No, please, I, I, it would be good to hear your um, a question or your, or your comments. Ms. Hakem. And please, if there's any other question that you have, uh, this is the moment to ask it as well. You don't feel comfortable? Uh, I, I will just uh, translate. Ah, OK, okay. OK. Vous allez parler français? Oui. OK, mais uh, I think. I will just make an okay. okay. interpretation. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm improvising this, so please bear <laughs> with me. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Allez-y. Oui, parlez, parlez. Parlez français. Oui, oui. Euh, je préfère parler français parce que mon anglais n'est pas exceptionnel. Pas de problème. Euh, non, je voulais juste apporter un témoignage sur la manière dont la ville de Nantes avait euh, organisé euh, les, premiers, les premiers accueils des réfugiés euh, ukrainiens. Ah, oh, yes. yes. Sorry, I wanted to um, give a first... Um, a testimony about how the, Nantes, uh, the city of Nantes has welcomed Ukrainian refugees. Uh, oh, I, I propose to read my... Okay. Uh, Go ahead. In English. Yes? Vas-y. Uh, vas-y, vas-y, bravo. Um, the city of Nantes has organized uh, itself to facilitate the first reception of Ukrainian uh, refugees from the beginning by setting up a reception center uh, for the arriving people. Yes, it's mm -hmm. good. <laughs> Care, listening, presence of translator, financial aid, transport aid, shelter in hotel, uh, social workers for access to rights, uh, catering, 
uh, access to health care. This work is done in conjunction uh, with government services, associations, including the Red Cross and the Regional Health Agency. Since March, between um, 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 between 30 and 50 uh, people um, a day have uh, been uh, received. Nantes has been less affected than other cities, but more than uh, 100 1,000 uh, people have arrived in the cities. In addition, the city of Nantes and the municipalities of the metropolitis are providing yes, long-term housing for these families mm. uh, under the supervision of the state. You understand what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's voilà. really good. Go on. Um, no voilà, je, je, je voulais euh, donner cet exemple euh, tout simplement parce que euh, entre la décision d'accueillir de, de, des réfugiés et la mise en place et la réalisation pour les villes, c'est compliqué euh, de répondre immédiatement aux besoins. Je voudrais juste donner un exemple. Euh, par exemple... Euh, euh, par rapport aux, aux personnes qui sont euh, d'autres réfugiés politiques qui sont, euh, qui sont accueillis, ils n'ont pas accès aux mêmes droits. Parce que pour les Ukrainiens, euh, tout de suite euh, ont été mis en place mmh. les droits à la santé, les droits à pouvoir accéder à un logement, etc. Et que euh, ça crée une, une compétition mmh. entre ces personnes. Ça, c'est le premier point. Euh, je vais juste traduire, traduire. si jamais uh, vous n'avez pas compris. Uh, sorry, I'm mixing my languages. So, Ms. Abassia is pointing to the fact that there is an inequality in the treatment of refugees coming in from Ukraine and the others who are already in Nantes, and this creates a sense of competition between different groups of people. Alizy. Et la, la deuxième euh, inégalité, enfin la deuxième difficulté, c'est que euh, évidemment il y a un centre d'accueil qui s'est mis, mis en place euh, pour accueillir les réfugiés ukrainiens, sauf que euh, l'État n'a pas fait suivre les conditions techniques et matérielles pour pouvoir les accueillir. Okay. Et donc c'est à la charge des villes de mettre ça en place. Un exemple tout simple. Euh, quand, ils accueillent et qu ils se font quand on les accueille et qu'ils se font enregistrer, euh, on leur dit, on va vous renvoyer euh, par mail les informations nécessaires, sauf qu'ils n'ont pas, eux, le téléphone ou les, les, les conditions techniques pour recevoir le mail. Okay. Et donc, il a fallu euh, apporter euh, ces éléments-là. Mm -hmm. Merci beaucoup. So, uh, Ms. Abassia is also saying that the state hasn't provided all the technical uh, tools necessary and response. So, for instance, they, if they are to receive a, a message uh, by telephone or, or, or some, yeah, telephone, you said, it's not always easy because they may not have a telephone. So, thank you very much. And those are very practical demonstrations, illustrations of the challenges cities face. Thank you very much. And um, sorry about my translation, but I've done my best. Uh, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. So the response that has come in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, homelessness coming in very high, mental health, housing, youth minimum income, equity in care. Um, and I think perhaps give a screenshot of this to Dominique. Uh, to all of us, actually, because I think this will be uh, very, very useful to take home for us. Thank you also very much for your response. Now we're coming to the, yes, starting the second round of questions. And this is also, I, goes to, I think the question goes to the core of what we've been discussing, which is actually working together. And uh, the question is, so how can cities, national governments, EU institutions work together to reform the care systems in order for the care systems to respond to these many, many challenges and hopes that uh, people have um, about, about uh, how we go forward in this 
as you said, Kim, the society of care that we're hoping to create in Europe. So, uh, Laura, I'm going to start with you as well. A lot has been said about how this is actually not working very well, people coming together. Obviously, we're all sitting here from different sectors and working together. But in real life, in practical terms, what can be done to make this a more efficient process? Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to to be listening to your thoughts uh, this very wide and profound reflections in this panel i believe actually that we've uh, revered the impact of the several recent crises and, and the impact on the citizenship we've discussed the impact of the housing crisis in 2008 and the case of Spain that still goes on with a huge impact on the actual rights of the city when you don't have housing and you fight every day to prevent an eviction for instance with kids and also this has an impact on children and uh, every other right in the city has been banned because of that we've also discussed the crisis of care that came from the starting question and this crisis actually comes a, a long way and i'm talking about the context i know but in the case of spain that's been a claim for quite a few years now and the pandemic just made it more visible it made more visible how care is sustained by families mainly and by families i mean women and also the impact on equal access to rights for women or access to the work market or even access to your own time and to you know self-care which is a terminology that's been used by feminists for some time but we can't seem to be generating politic, uh, public policies in that regard we've also discussed how this crisis has had an impact on the care systems and particularly with the aging of the population care to old people so multiple crises the pandemic um, probably put on the table some of the less visible one such as the care crisis but tackling all of this has to be done with a very critic perspective of the institutional ability to respond so we've had to respond and uh, also the learnings we've had over the pandemic you know at some point everyone was uh, locked in at home and uh, we were talking about uh, the impact of the pandemic mental health and pandemic old people in pandemic so if you ask me uh, if we ask uh, if we had to go through a similar situation now we should have a more critic perspective probably and taking into account that uh, care systems and systems to care for disability and old people uh, we wouldn't be in a much better place because we have not closed a city agreement a city covenant or a regional covenant or a european wide agreement so that if this happened again the care system to old people in the case of catalonia for instance lots of people died in uh, and in homes in elderly homes often without information to their relatives um actually would like to thank the um, municipal institute for um, social services uh, but the coordination at that point was almost to you know take out corpses from uh, elderly homes who had died without the necessary care without an integrated health and care system without taking into account the aging processes to guarantee autonomy at home as much as possible to guarantee habitational and and, and coexistent um, systems to, to live at home before you go to an elderly home where you lose autonomy almost right away so i believe we have not learned or we have not reacted quickly enough so that if we found ourselves in a similar situation soon um, even the framework would not change so much you know the even the mindset of public policies on which the framework is set i believe it's wrong in the case of spain it's the framework of dependence which is uh, which doesn't have 
resources which has with, which has not made any deep review of the social the social demographic status uh, with no resources and this is why cities have to raise our voice and demand more global strategies with resources in the case of Spain again the law of dependence is not providing good care to people in need and it's not accompanying the main caregivers in a financial manner because often these are relatives women who are you know giving their lives up uh, for this very hard physical and mental work having to be with a relative in a moment in which they lose their abilities with degenerative diseases and so on. We do not do it either with children. In this case, uh, it is a more, much, much more rewarding, maybe, care, but it is also very intensive. And in the case of Barcelona, you may not have time to, to visit it, but we started a municipal babysitting service. This is a free service, and what we want to do is, uh, based on this self-care perspective, we want to offer the opportunity to women in situation of intensive care of children with a, with a scarce family network. Uh, because, of course, you know, grandpas and, and grandmas save our lives to many daddies and mommies in the city, but not everyone has this community and, and family network, and we want to work from a community perspective on care being closer and closer to the population with this project is called Villa Veina and it uh, basically puts care and community in relationship with others with more public services accompanying caregivers offering services and public equipments to the grandmothers and to the to the old people they are taken care of we should not um, forget you know grandpas and, and, and grandmas that are taking care of their grandsons and granddaughters in the park and it's cold in the winter and uh, this service allows you to I don't know get your driving permit or be a social volunteer or just get a coffee with a friend because sometimes when you when we talk about emotional well-being and mental health there is a preemptive part that has to do with the time needed to reflect and think and enjoy and often women in intensive caregiving situations do not have that and this municipal service which was inspired by the ministry of equality and has been replicated elsewhere and is now beginning to spread for us is a small action a little action maybe not the first one maybe we have to start um, we wouldn't start with this babysitting service but with the powers we have in the cities, we know this has an impact on the life of people. Real impact, as you pointed out. Thank you very much indeed for that, Laura. Aldona, from your point of view, also the need to work uh, across yes, sectors? You know, I have to say that we are in Poland in this uh, specific situation, because in fact uh, big cities are in the opposition to the government. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to say it because mm -hmm. it's com it's it's make this uh, situation much more complicated of it's uh, of course uh, in this uh, during this refugees uh, crisis when we all know and are talking about it that cities are the main places mm -hmm. when we are fighting with the uh, refugees crisis so it's uh, very very um, hard to us to cooperate mm -hmm. with our government of course during the um, refugee uh, refugee crisis we are cooperating uh, that's true but when we are talking about the future about mm -hmm. some solutions for the future it's 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 uh, it's it's not so easy, and of course the second the second uh, thing that is relationships means uh, between our government and uh, European Union. It's a little bit complicated, yeah. so no, it's really for us very strange uh, uh, situations. But to be honest, we have no time. We, because, mm -hmm. for example, we know about the numbers, you know, 700,000 refugees come to Warsaw, 300,000 refugees are in Warsaw. But let me say the, 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 the one point. We have now, we estimate that maybe 100,000 children. In our schools, in our education system, it's only 200,000. And of course, okay, capacity it's enough we can manage it we don't know what will be in the future because we know that now a lot of uh, uh, children uh, ukrainian children uh, 
state in the uh, Ukrainian system and they have uh, lessons and um, schools online. But of course, we have to help them with places for, for these online lessons, with um, tablets, with computers to take care about children after the school. So it's, maybe it's not so many people, so many children, but it's our responsibility. But one will be in three months when, for example, let's say mm -hmm. 60, 100,000 children decide to go to our system. You know, we should, for three months, build 100 schools. It's impossible. Mm. It's just impossible when we are talking about housing. It's the same point. A lot of them, mainly, a lot of refugees and a lot of Ukrainians uh, live in our houses, in, uh, in, our, in our homes. It's incredibly generous. You know, we are a family. We are one big family now. Polish and Ukrainians, but it won't be forever. It will, it will finish in one moment. So what we will do with the people who lose their place, lose their houses in the future? Mm. We are afraid about the some second wave mm. of refugees, but from people who uh, lose their, their, their homes, who will be our homelesses. Mm. So it's why we have no time, what I, what I, can, uh, what I can say, to uh, think about it, to discuss about the solutions, uh, new instruments, uh, new programs, because for us, it's not a years, it, if it's even not a month, it's days or weeks, we have to decision. And what that can say, of course, uh, international organization who, what's, who supported us immediately, it's, it's a big support. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say uh, 200 uh, teachers, we employ from the budget of UNICEF and uh, coordinators and kindergartens and things like that. But it's, it's very, very, very important, but it's not a system for the future because, I'm sorry, they didn't stay with us forever. <laughs> I, I'd like, but it's impossible to either. So we have to immediately find a, some solution because, you know, in the social care, we have now uh, our old uh, challenges and all of uh, each of it, each of it has a new number because the refugees, we know uh, um, among the refugees, it's, uh, it's uh, um, mainly women and children. Mm. We mentioned it and elderly. So every our problems we had with human rights, with women rights, with access to uh, market labor, with uh, um, uh, child care, we have double now. Mm. So what, what I can say, it's very important to us that, to, that not only discuss about the solutions, about the cooperate and working together and to find the solutions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, indeed, enormous challenges. Um, let me just go very quickly to you, uh, uh, Philippe, to respond, and then I'll go to Kim and Dominique. I'll give you the last word. So, um, well, on the, I mean, UNICEF is going to focus on the child guarantee. We are the pilot organization for the child guarantee. Uh, it's UNICEF mandate to, to make it work. Uh, even if we have our own financing, we want to make it work because it's unique for public policy making for the most vulnerable children. And would that have an impact on the problems yes. that... Uh so the, what is missing is the connect between the central government, it's a central, I mean, the commissioner yesterday was saying it, funding mechanism, but then the cities are actually the, the best implementers yeah. in terms of being the most, I mean, the closest to vulnerable people. Yeah. Because that instrument is around vulnerability uh, mitigation. So you need to have the work organized by those that are know where the Roma community lives. And central government doesn't know, with best intent. Sometimes mm. political opposition complicate things, but they are remote from the actual mm. uh, population that we need to target through the child guarantee. And we need to make this child guarantee work by having a better connect with um, municipalities. So what we are going to do as UNICEF, we, we coordinate more and more a technical group. With, you know, every country in the EU has now appointed a child guarantee coordinator. Mm. So how do we connect cities, colleagues like you, uh, already engaged in social affairs and so on, with this gar child guarantee coordinator, so that we start to build synergies and through this technical uh, sharing of experience, we have more proximity in terms of the various level of governance. So that will be a commitment for us uh, to respond to you, how to make it work between cities and mm -hmm. government. 
you, UNICEF being the, the pilot organization for the child guarantee, that helps to give us that possibility to do right. it. And that's a commitment. Of course, we'll continue to, uh, to work. I mean, we were so on other big cities mm -hmm. on them. Uh, to try to see how we can build further the system, leveraging again the child guarantee, because this government, yeah. we are not using actually the child guarantee. That's it's a right. new mechanism. It's not that, say, yes, hurrah, right, let's go for it. We still need to convince quite a number of government and fast track EU in terms of uh, the disbursement, yeah. so it hasn't lost its own. Uh, and we got commission, the vice president of the commission, uh, Madame Suissa's commitment and Commissioner Schmidt's commitment to fast track the funding. Okay. Madame Suissa said herself, I was myself years ago a refugee with my daughter, mm. so I know how it feels. Right. So using the child guarantee for this refugee crisis, for all your uh, expenditure as well, is a way also to move forward around that. Oh, thank you very much for that, for that uh, I would say, very important information um, that you've given us. So, Kim, uh, let's have your uh, sentiments about some of the issues we've discussed so far. Well, I see um, there on the screen that homelessness is um, mm -hmm. the main priority. And um, in the European Parliament, I worked on a report um, on access to decent and affordable housing, and homelessness what it was a very core part of that report. Um, and the European Parliament called for ending homelessness by 2030. And as most of you probably know, um, some months later, the Lisbon Declaration was actually adopted. Um, all the member states, all the, um, the European Parliament, European Council and the European Commission, we all said we are making this commitment. We are working towards ending homelessness by 2030. And I think this has a lot of aspects, because I also saw in the beginning that housing was mm -hmm. for a long time one of the main things. And we, of course, have two, two sides of the story, right? Um, ending homelessness, we know housing first is a solution that works very well. Um, we know that um, if you think that you can solve homelessness um, for every person that is homeless in the same matter, it's not going to work. We have to differentiate, we have to look at the circumstances of people, age, gender, um, uh, sexual orientation, everything um, is, is impacting the way uh, in which you can provide the best help for people that are homeless. And on the other side, we're also seeing this huge influx of more people becoming homeless. Um, the amount of homeless people has estimated, uh, we have estimated that it's probably doubled in the last 10 years. And with the current situation, I don't see that this is going to go down, rather the opposite, it's going to be even worse. And um, of course we have now a situation where we were already in a housing crisis, and now we also have an influx of refugees who also need housing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the core thing we have to do is to make sure we don't let these people be played against each other. Mm. Um, because if we do that, then, you know, uh, in the end, uh, we're going to talk about who deserves the, a human right. Um, and I don't think that is the way we want our societies to go. However, we do need to change things. We have to make sure that housing becomes more affordable, that there is enough housing. And actually, if you look at a lot of cities, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of housing, but a lot of housing has, for example, become an illegal hotel through short-term holiday rental platforms. Um, and um, I think, um, so the, the Lisbon Declaration was signed in Lisbon and there um, they've actually done something very interesting where during the pandemic they've actually changed a lot of Airbnb um, into uh, housing first apartments, which I think for example is quite radical, but it's working. <laughs> and it's actually, you know, um, not only uh, providing people with houses, but also um, diminishing the uh, noise pollution, for example, that people are getting from uh, all the tourists that are suddenly getting into neighborhoods. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that we, we, we can do to actually try to increase the amount of housing that there is for homeless people. But if we don't stop, the incoming of more people that are homeless, and we see that there's an increase in economic homeless people, which is people that they have a job, mm -hmm. they have a family, or actually often our economic homeless people are people that have been recently divorced, would like to stay living close to, um, to their ex-partners and, uh, and their children, um, but are simply not able to afford another house. Um, because nowadays you, ha you have to have a double income to afford a house anyways. Um, and um, the people that are taking care of them 
um, are built are in the system for the people that are chronically homeless. So the care budget that, that there is for homeless people is now going also to um, economic homeless people, people that wouldn't have to be homeless if there were simply enough affordable houses. So we have a huge crisis here, and I'm very happy that you know the Commission, um, together with the European Platform on Combating Homelessness, is now really working towards this goal, towards ending homelessness by 2030. We've set up, um, we're setting up a system where we can have mutual learning among cities. What works? What doesn't work? How do we make sure that we strengthen each other? Um, but also we're, we're looking at how do we make sure um, that people from other European countries and from other member states go to one member state. Um, how do we make sure that there is funding for the cities so, we, so that actually um, you know, the freedom of movement doesn't become a burden on the care system for homeless people. Um, so these are things that we are working on and I'm very happy that Eurocities is also involved in this. Um, and um, I think this is something that, um, that we will uh, see much more coming in the future. But I think um, this is not the only part because I also saw that there's a lot of things about equity here. And I think that is something that is that is very important. And I think um, also uh, Laura already addressed it. You know, this this gender aspect. It's it's crucial that we that we have a, a stronger look at that, because we see that on average women do uh, 13 hours um, more unpaid care per week than men. 13 hours per week. Um, this is an is. is incomprehensible, but I guess we all know how that, what that looks like, right? Uh, like the number is incomprehensible, but the practice is what we're used to. Um, and this is something that we really need to change. And we see that on the one hand, we have um, you know, this, this informal care, uh, unpaid care done by women. Um, a lot of uh, women with a migration background um, that, that suffer from intersectional discrimination. Um, and we know that you know, this goes through into this care system. And my plea to make sure that people in the care system, that work in the care system, frontline workers, are valued more, that is in line with our society valuing people doing care work, unpaid care work, taking care of family members, you know, that, that it's all in the same vein. And I think it's very important that we have a stronger look at that, um, that we make sure that, for example, the people that keep our society going through doing informal work get formalized, that we actually make sure that they can have a vacation, mm -hmm. that they can take a sick day off, um, that they can provide for their family, they don't have to uh, work in, in an informal way, but also that we make sure um, that, uh, that they, you know, if, if you have to do uh, unpaid care for a while, um, that you don't lose out that uh, we don't, it doesn't become a gap on your CV, mm -hmm. so to say, or um, a gap in your pension. Mm. Um, these are all things that we have to really transform in our societies if we want to make sure that caring is respected, mm. valued, and the core of our society. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. Dominic, your final word. Yes, <coughs> thank you. I will follow on what Kim just said about homelessness. So, as Kim said, there has been a huge increase, uh, explosion of homelessness, and one can consider that it is a symptom of a failing care system. And it's looking at homeless people is the end of the pipeline, but one has to look at what mm -hmm. led people to become homeless. And as Kim said, the profile of homeless people has changed significantly over the last 20 years and this is for Laura, 20 years ago, most homeless people were men, and so there was gender imbalance in this, uh, this area. And what we have seen, and it, this is quite dramatic, is not anybody today can become homeless. Young people, children, women, old people. So it has, and it shows that in all aspects, the, the social system is kind of crumbling. And this is why when we come to discuss about a care strategy, there is a quantitative and a qualitative dimension. It's clear that the population, and I come back to my argument about demographics, the population, the paradigm has changed, and we will need to invest more in the care system. It, we cannot just assume that with the same money, we will privatize and it will be more efficient, and then we will be okay. No, it's, it will imply a rebudgeting, 
at all levels, at city level, national mm. level, EU level. And there I would uh, quickly jump into uh, the EU funding one billion question. Mm. Uh, the funding will not come from the EU. The EU is all of us. There is not somewhere someone printing money and giving it. Uh, so it means there will be a rebalancing of budgets. Uh, which, of course, no, at the time when we start increasing defense budgets, is not going to be an easy uh, rebalancing, but it will have to come. At the same time, uh, there is a need to have more care, care providers, which means people who need to be, more people who need to be trained for this, and also uh, people who already do it need to be retrained because the t clients are not, no longer the same. So it's a, it's a quite complex situation. And if we design a strategy, and it, there will be an EU strategy with the expectation there will be national strategies, city strategies, which all have to evolve. And I come back to my argument about what is structurally changing, and that will need to be taken into account in those new strategies. So it's quite a, a change of padding, but it's a kind of uh, a revolution it's, uh, that is coming. And uh, today we talk about digital transition, we talk about green transition, but the care transition mm -hmm. will be the other revolution in our societies. Yes. So for all of this, it means that all the partners and all the stakeholders at their levels will need to work together. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, we, uh, we started this discussion about the EU care strategy, but it is our strategy. It's not something coming top down. It will be a collective effort. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for bringing in the care revolution. I think this is a very transformational moment as well. And you pointed to it. I think we have time now for just one final Slido question. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, announce some housekeeping rules and we will have our lunch. So what cha changes do you want to see in the organization of care in your city? Please answer this question. And I'm going to turn to the panelists very quickly going the other way around now. In just 30 seconds each one, your hope for the future. So. Um, Let's start with you, Philippe, while we get the slider results. Your hope for the future. Uh, now, okay. Yes, yes, oh, yes, now. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds, I'm counting. Ch children became, uh, become truly the, the heart of our, of our cities, of our civilization. Okay, Kim. That we make people resilient enough to stand all the crises that were coming ahead of us through providing them with the basic care and needs and security that everyone needs in our society to withstand anything that comes towards them. Thank you. Dominique. Uh, I would like that there is not us and them. One day we will be on the other side and one day we will be clients of care and we will, be, we will need the support. So we should always consider that we don't do it just for the others, we do it for all of us. Mm. Okay, Thank I can you. say about financial support to govern, local governments, but uh, maybe we should think about it out of the box, mm. that existing financial instruments and strategy, there's no you know, uh, moon on the sky. You can change it. <laughs> right, right. Not descended from the, the, the big one up there. Okay, yes. Very good. Laura, as the host of this wonderful conference, your final 30 seconds. I would like to give you a reflection on the uh, European framework. I would ask Europe in general and leaders in particular, that we go back to European values framed in the inclusion, diversity, and that we think and what we've done, what has happened with this fortress Europe and the difficulties that people coming to Europe uh, suffering, looking for a better life. So I think that's a message uh, for cities regarding the values, the initial values of the European Union. 
strongly the need for European values to be actually implemented and not just talked about. Thank you very much indeed. So what would we pref like to have from our uh, care organizations? More flexibility, which is what Aldona talked about, solidarity, which we've all talked about. More creativity, more funds that we've mm -hmm. talked about. Once again, could we take a screenshot because I'd like to really uh, remember all these very, very important messages that have come through. Thank you very much indeed to our panelists. Let's give them big applause. <laughs> Let's also give a big applause again to Blanca, who is here. <laughs> to the wonderful people who made the city pledges. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to Yusuf Sultan, who started off the day. <laughs> to the organizers, the interpreter, the technicians, who are making this wonderful conference flow so smoothly. <laughs> So I'm not going to, I'm not going to summarize uh, everything that's been said. We've all heard it and we've seen it uh, in action. Just some uh, uh, housekeeping rules that, and announcements that I have to make, so bear with me as I read them. So there's going to be a family photograph, and for that, all participants, so all of us, we should go to the family photo, which is going to take place at the top part of the stairs at the main entrance of the venue. So I think we know that, it's a magnificent uh, entrance, so I think we have to go there. And right after that, there will be a short visit of the venue, which will take place at the back door, on the same entrance floor. And then lunch will be served for everyone. Uh, and then I was told, if the weather allows it, well, the weather definitely <laughs> allows it. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Um, and then uh, next on the program, as I said, family photo, and then there's an artistic break. Uh, we discovered the venue, lunch, special program for city directors. Uh, that starts at 13.40 uh, with a roundtable discussion and followed by a site visit. Um, and then you have uh, a film screening and then you have an informal dinner at a place of your own choice. Does that mean at a place of your own choice? Um, and everyone is free to choose their informal dinner. And, and, and we will meet again tomorrow. Uh, and I will be here again uh, in the plenary room um, for the conclusions of our forum. At, that's at 11.45 tomorrow, uh, Friday. So once again, thank you, everyone, and uh, let's have thank a you. brilliant afternoon. And we were told that yeah. the, there's a bigger uh, room yeah, for the yeah, film screening. So if you yeah, are interested, even interested. if you didn't register for the film screening, right. you are welcome to come if, that's, uh, if, if you wish. Don't worry about registering or not registering. The room allows for all of us if you want to come for the cinema. Yeah, see you. <laughs>